Welcome everybody. This is Rush University Medical Center Division of Virology Renal Biopsy Conference for September 9th, 2023. We do not have a CME activity code today. Um, having some trouble getting them, but uh, that won't stop us from having a great conference. Uh, we have nothing to disclose as usual and uh, patient confidentiality is very well um, preserved uh, throughout the whole pre renal uh, presentation here. We have a, a fun case today, a lot of twists. Um, and several polls that I think we'll have some fun with. This is a very odd case, Dr. Corbett's sharing with us. Um, and I think, Steve, you ready for the protocol? I am ready. All right. For the patients, a 40-year-old white male who has a history of proteinuria since 2012, he was first seen by a nephrologist in June of 2021 for evaluation of proteinuria. Evaluation at that time demonstrated a normal CMP with a serum creatinine of 0.9, serum albumin of 4.3. CBC was normal. Urinalysis had 3 plus protein, but was otherwise normal. Urine protein creatinine ratio was 2.1 gram per gram. And a serologic evaluation, which we'll see down at the bottom, was completely negative. Ultrasound was done and was normal. He had no complaints and specifically had no edema. Past medical and surgical history were for hypertension since 2002. He had hyperlipidemia, had GERD, and he was obese. He smoked a half pack uh, cigarettes a day for uh, at least 20 years. And there was no family history of renal disease. He had no allergies. His medications included lisinopril, dapagliflozin, metaprolol, uh, pantoprazole, rosuvastatin. Uh, he, had, he was on no NSAIDs. Uh, and had taken no COX-2 inhibitors as well. His blood pressure was 126 over 78. Pulse was 85. Uh, he was 5 feet 11, 260 pounds. BMI was 37. The exam was normal. Uh, specifically, again, there was no edema. Lab data prior to his biopsy, sodium 140, potassium 43, chloride 106, bicarb 26, B120, and a creatinine of 0.9, GFR of 96. Glucose, total protein, albumin, calcium, phosphorus, LFTs were all normal. Total cholesterol was 233. White count was normal. Hemoglobin normal. Platelet count was normal. Specific gravity on urinalysis was 1020. He had three plus protein, uh, no blood uh, by dipstick. He did have glucose uh, because of the SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, no abnormal sediment. The urine protein creatinine ratio was uh, 2.1, again, gram per gram. And the uh, serologic evaluation, uh, urine and serum immunofixation complement levels, ANA, MPO, and PR3 ANCA, hep C, hep B, surface antigen, PLA2 antibody were all normal or negative. So we're going to start with a poll here, um, very simple poll. Would you biopsy this patient? Yes or no? Before you want to put, might put the, back, the screen back on, which, which the story, once you get the poll up, just to remind people what we've got here. Well, while the poll is going up, could I ask some questions? I'm sorry. Thanks. Sorry, Bill. Steve, did you have an, uh, do you have an AC ratio? No, actually, no. This was a second opinion. Uh, I, I went back, actually, because I knew this question would come up, and he didn't, there wasn't one. Okay. And then also, was the... Um... Proteinuria that you had there at 2.1 grams, was that on lisinopril and on aflosin already, or was that prior to him getting on those? That was, he was already on the lisinopril. The SGLT2 in all honesty was started shortly after that. Okay. Thank Steve, you. Buddy. Yeah, I, I should have left that off, but he was already on lisinopril for his hypertension. Steve, do you have any idea how much proteinuria was in 2012 when the, was it all? No, you know, okay. that was historic. That was basically, that was historic. I talked to his nephrologist as well. We, couldn't, we didn't have anything that went back that far, but the patient himself remembered being told that. Um, so it really came from him. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's a pretty bright guy, actually, but uh, it came from him. Let the poll go a couple seconds here. Probably, ooh, probably good right there. Last yeah. few. Okay. That's good. We got a good, we got a good poll. So about two thirds wood biopsy and about one third wooden biopsy. Now it's always a little bit biased here because this is biopsy conference and, and, uh, you know, presumably we've got something to show, but that, that may not be the case. And uh, we'll also decide 
uh, how much the biopsy helps us in a case like this as we go through it. Um, you all see the two-thirds, one-third. So two-thirds said yes. One -third. There's a couple of interesting comments. Um, one says, what is the indication for SGLT2 inhibition? You know, I, I think that's a legitimate question. Um, other, and I would just answer it that's, is that uh, some people are approaching SGLT2 inhibitors uh, like uh, should be put in the water with anybody with renal disease. Um, I don't know, you know, I'm not going to try to defend it more than that, but I think it's, it, that's what a lot of people are doing now. But I could see, or I could see why it's asked without going into it too much. Um, uh, another mention uh, was an interesting question, which I will have the uh, faculty address when we discuss it, and that could this be a tubular mediated proteinuria um, seen with patients uh, Crestor, um, and would you maybe get off the Crestor and see? And uh, so I'll, I'm going to ask Bill to discuss this case, but. Um, Bill, why don't you start with just that one question? What do you think about this being all, because I think you actually alluded to the asking too whether or not this was, if we had an albumin creatinine ratio to kind of determine this is glomerular or tubular. Do you think that this could be possibly enough from just uh, from the, uh, from the uh, Crestor? And I'll hand it over. Yeah, sure. Uh, Crestor is known, especially at high doses, to cause tubular interstitial proteinuria. Two grams would be a little bit high, but... Um... Uh, I think that could be explained. I mean, he doesn't have nephrotic syndrome, and we don't know what type of proteinuria he is. I would say that he has three plus protein on the dipstick, um, which does kind of assume that it is going to be albumin, but you know, the dipsticks aren't perfect. And so I think it's there. And I think if I saw this case, patient and he had a very low ACPC ratio, uh, I certainly would stop the, uh, the Crestor and repeat things before I went to a biopsy. But I think in this case, it looks like we're going to assume it's albuminuria because there is three plus protein on the dipstick, and we probably want to be biopsying for crestor induced proteinuria. Let me uh, let me let me just make one comment. Doctor Baxi says patient did have proteinuria. Would it not be unre would not be unreasonable to start SGLT2 on this patient as on? Well, you know, the SGLT2 studies were about CKD. They really weren't targeting proteinuria as much as they were targeting CKD. So I'm not so sure that that's all that that's necessarily the case as it might be with aces and arbs. People can argue with me, um, but uh, I, that's why I don't think it's such a crazy question whether or not SGLT is would be automatically for a person like this who's uh, um, whose creatinine is you know relatively normal if not normal. So, and then um, and then Bill, before you answer, would you abide see this patient? Yes. Um, if it's 2.1 grams and it's mostly albumin and that's on lisinopril and DAPA, yeah, uh, there's no question. That means that realistically, in my mind, they probably had three or four grams at one point, and that's a little little bit higher than where I'd be comfortable. If he was not on those medicines and he had two grams, mm, I might watch, knowing that it might be ORG or something that we want to be treating with. And that's despite the stability in the in the renal function, presumably for, for a decade, you'd still biopsy? I would. Okay. Now, now, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a comment. Uh, Absolutely. I would have actually preferred him to be on Ozempic instead of uh, dapagliflozin for two reasons. Uh, that he is, his BMI is quite high. He's quite overweight, 260 pounds, I think I saw. Uh, you know, so I, I think we should seriously consider looking at Ozempic in this kind of situation. Does have some anti proteinuric activity too. So I would have preferred this. Tapaglofazin is a very small dose, five milligram, but I think we should start thinking about Ozempic too. It's a good point. Realize this was done before I think Ozempic was uh, was available, but uh, regardless, it's a good point. Now, Interesting, Bill, though, if you're going to use it for weight loss, at least in this country, you have to use the Wagovi. Okay. They won't get it. And I only know this because a patient came in and they wanted to put him on Ozempic and the insurance wouldn't pay for it for weight loss. So they had to use, at least in this country, they had to use the Wagovi preparation, which is the exact same thing. It's just a different company. So, Bill, uh, now you can give us a differential diagnosis. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, my, my first thought was the Crestor thing. We've discussed that. The second thing, though, is if it is albuminuria, there's, I think, a pretty good likelihood there's a glomerular disease here. And what could he have? I mean, obesity-related glomerulopathy and focal sclerosis can give you um, slow indolent proteinuria, you know, that can progress over time. Um, that's pretty high up there, given what his BMI is. Um, could he have some sort of other FSGS lesion that's not related to obesity, uh, some other pattern of injury? 
sure, there's always genetic FSGSs or other um, you know types of secondary FSGSs, but I wouldn't really be suspicious of a primary FSGS as the cause of that pattern of injury uh, because he doesn't really have nephrotic syndrome. Is it possible? Sure, but I don't think that really fits in with his clinical presentation. And thus, I wouldn't really add minimal change to this um, uh, differential either. Could he have a membranous that's not quite nephrotic yet? Sure, I think that's up there too. Um, and then could he have something odd, strange, you know, um, amyloid it's, or something like that? It's not in the demographic. It just doesn't happen that often in this young person. Um, could he have, I don't know, we've been seeing some strange things in some other young people like the, uh, you know, like the mast IgG SAP positive membranous. I mean, all those are possible, bo possibles. But if I saw him, I'd be most worried about obesity related glomerulopathy. That's my number one. I'm sorry, what about his smoking? Yeah, and I think Reen, Dr. Reen just put that in the chat too, uh, which uh, can give you a nodular glomerular sclerosis that really looks a lot like diabetic nephropathy, but um, in the patient that doesn't have diabetes. So yeah, that's on the differential as well. Um, Dr. Gashti. Yeah, I agree with Bill. I think, I think that the guys had nine years of non-progressive just subnephrotic proteinuria with no no kidney, no um, renal failure associated with it, normal blood pressure, normal albumin, no edema, normal blood pressure, despite obviously two meds, but nonetheless, uh, it doesn't, seems like, um, I think a secondary form of FSGS from possibly his weight is probably the most likely ex explanation. So in that case, we would probably see a perihilar lesion um, if we are going with a traditional FSGS classification, but like Bill said, a, a PLA 2R negative membranous possible, all of those things that he said are, are possible, but I'm going to go with a secondary FSGS. And Dr. Glassick had brought up the chat, you know, what about, um, you know, genetic testing first? And, you know, every week this is coming up and every week it comes up earlier in the chat and, uh, you know, every week we're going to probably move more to something like that. I think that's not an unreasonable uh, at 40, I think that's a very reasonable thing, especially when he doesn't have the nephrotic syndrome. Um, I don't think that was readily available at this time either, but uh, um, I think that's a, something we're going to see more and more of, and I think it's probably a good idea. Uh, you never know what you're going to find, and we've learned how have seen some very interesting surprises uh, through the, the readily available, now readily available genetic testing, so I think that's a good point too. Um, anybody else have any other thoughts? Good question. Um, Somebody asked if the patient was obese in 2012. Yes. Asked and answered. <laughs> um, good. Uh, we have another, we're going to actually poll. I think we have the poll on what people think. Yeah, let's um, see what people think now that people have kind of do the, <laughs> gone through the differential. Give me a second. Yeah, you know, we we could have we actually could have put instead of chronic interstitial nephritis, we could have put normal because um, the uh, the proteinuria associated with uh, with statins is not it's a functional tubular defect. It's not a uh, a uh, histologic uh, interstitial nephritis. So we could have put that in there. Uh, normal renal biopsy if you feel strongly that the um, robustatin <laughs> was was causing this. Um, but we've gotten one membranous PLA2R negative because PLR2 is negative. We have obesity-related glomerulopathy. We have idiopathic nodular glomerular sclerosis and chronic interstitial nephritis. So we'll give it a little time here. I think we always have to put a number five of other, and then we can see what people uh, put in the chat because sometimes there's some funny ones that uh, might have bearing. You mean the Earl Smith phenomena you always throw in? You ITG. Always get, you always say ITG. ITG, not, exactly. In, in the old biopsy conference days, the wait, live biopsy conference days. There it is. Live in person biopsy conference days. You always throw in an ITG, and you know you even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. That's my and, line. That's your line. That's my line. Uh, that's a common <laughs> line. It's an acorn. Oh yeah, okay, an acorn. Yeah. An acorn is a nut, Steve. I know. I'm not, I understand I'm, that. I'm a city boy. I'm not a country boy like you. <laughs> well, then we can talk about rats then. 
so you can see the results okay we've got uh yeah the majority thinks it's org uh 66 percent we've got about 10 percent with membranous 20 percent there's number two with idiopathic nodular glomerular sclerosis and a and one person with uh I think that's a really good uh, answer. I think that's, if I had to put my odds down, that's the way I would have put the odds down. I like that a lot. So um, I think we'll move ahead to the wheel uh, and see who's going to read the biopsy. Extra powerful spoon today. I didn't welcome our, uh, we have some, we have some uh, visiting uh, interviews today. I want to welcome them. I apologize. Uh, Saba. All right. Saba actually is the only second year fellow here. Um, wow, the, the wheel is. Somehow the wheel and you. The wheel's right wisdom is beyond reproach. <laughs> All right. Give me a second here, Saba. Um, right. And she's on service. So give me a second. You should be able to. Uh, see the screen here. Uh, let me have you. So can you unmute yourself? Yep. Can you hear me? Uh, yep. And then I'm going to give you control. Go ahead and click on the screen. Go, Go ahead. Okay, um, so we have um, our trichrome stain here. Um, I see two cores. Um, Hold on, Saba, one second, all right? Give me one second here. Let me just fix that for you. That was my fault, not your fault. Um, right. Oops, let me get this fixed up for you. All right, there we go. I'm going to give you control again here. All right, click on the screen. All right, go ahead. Okay. So um, here's our trichrome stain. Um, we have two cores that look pretty good. Um, so looking for the light blue stain to identify any fibrosis, I see some, not a lot, but some along both, maybe a little bit more on this one, like 10-15%. Um, I do see some glomeruli throughout. It's really hard to characterize them further. Um, right, yeah, just focal fibrosis, about 10%. Yeah, I agree with you. We'll see if the glom's at a higher power. Okay, so we have a PAS uh, stain here. There's one glomerulus here in the middle. <clears throat> um, there's some areas of hypercellularity that I can see, but that might maybe around here as well. And then <clears throat> the capillary walls or the capillary loops are open. The walls look maybe a little bit thickened to me. Um, and then I don't see too much as far as like mesangial hypercellularity. Yeah, so uh, do, does this glomeruli like normal size or is it enlarged? Well, since you asked me the question, yeah, I would say, I guess it looks a little bit enlarged. Yeah, yeah, it, it's hypertrophy. We we'll call it glomerulomegaly. Glomerulomegaly. And in fact, on the next slide, we'll go to higher power, but we'll see it, it's enlarged. Um, and then you have some arterioles over there at 10 o'clock that are wide open, no hyalinosis. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, right there. Yeah, so normally on this power, a glomerulus would fill, uh, would, uh, you would, you could see it's expanded beyond the field um, of the image. So it is an enlarged and hypertrophied. Wow, okay. Doesn't it's fit in the screen. Same image, right? This is the rush measurement for glomerulomegaly. <laughs> That's right. We, we used to have a, 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 a measuring stick, but now it's whether or not it fits the screen. We've, 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 we've gone backward in time, but it works. Mel has that measuring stick somewhere in his home, and we've never been able to get it back. Yeah, so now we have to go by this one. But it's big. It, it, it fills it, 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 it bigger yeah. than the screen. It's quite large. Um, okay.
Um, okay, so this is our H and E stain. Um, let's see. So I see some areas of maybe some hypercellularity. It's hard to say. Maybe some zangel expansion around here. Um, and then maybe just some, uh, I guess, are these unlysed red blood cells, these red dots. Right. Um, and then maybe this little infiltrate here. Yeah, focal lymphocytic infiltrate, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, uh, and again, this glomerulus is enlarged. Yep. And you can just, de you determine that based on the size of it relative to yeah, from relative to normal, normal appearing glomeruli. Yeah. David, um, the prior slide that had the glomerulus with the PAS stain, I the mesangial, I mean, PAS is a better stain for to comment on the mesangium, and this doesn't seem that full, but the H&E, the one after, seems like the mesangium is much more expanded than, than, than this one, than the PAS. Is there... Would there be a reason for that? Yeah, that's a good observation, Casey. Yeah, I can't, I can't explain that, but it does it, it seem to be fuller here on the H and E, but the PAS doesn't really support that. Okay. Toba, do you see? Does this support a diagnosis of of nodular glomerular sclerosis that was in the differential because of his smoking? I don't see any obvious nodules per se, so I would say no. Yeah, it's a big no. David, uh, aside from the rush screen approach, uh, does the size of Bowman space help in the diagnosis of glomerulomegaly? Like in no. this case, it looks fairly smallish. No, I, I haven't, I haven't uh, found that to be helpful. Okay, moving on, we have another PAS stain. Um, glomerulus is here in the middle and there is, um, let's say some scarring here for sclerosis. Um, it's not really throughout the entire glomerulus. So maybe some here, some here. Yeah, uh, segmental scar. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be uh, at the high lung because at six o'clock, yeah, that's one of the, Arterials so, coming in or out, that open one there. Be like a parahyalur lesion. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so again, we have another PAS stain, uh, glomerulus here. And again, uh, I see another lesion here, which also appears to be around the hilum. Another le but lesion, you mean segmental scar? Segmental scar, yes. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. David, does the Hyler variety of FSGS suggest a secondary form? Uh, you could see them in, in, in either one, but yeah, more commonly than not, I, I see it in secondary FSGS. Thank you. Uh, okay, so here we have a Jones stain. So I'm just looking for any breaks or holes. And um, there's some areas that look like they might have some holes or spikes, maybe some spikes around here. I don't know if that's correct. Well, that's the mesangial area. You, you want to look on the basement membrane. Uh... Overall, they look kind of smooth, but you did go over. There are some irregularities, maybe down at the bottom of the screen. Um, like? And, and over to the left. Yeah, right there. It does look like there's some holes there. It looks irregular. And the one right above it. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. here -ish. It's subtle. Yeah, yeah it's very subtle. Um, but we did have membranous on our differential, so that's why I bring that up. Okay. So IgG stain is positive on immunofluorescence. 
uh, immunofluorescence staining for PLA two R. Wait, 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 but before you go on, go on to that. Is it capillary wall or, or where, where is the IgG? Uh, this looks like it's along the capillary walls. Yeah. 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 So granular capillary wall IgG. What's that diagnostic of? So would this be membranous? Yes. Good. We want to know the PLA2R, which is right there. The PLA2R is positive. Uh, and then we have our EM. Um, so right off the bat, I see these um, dense deposits. These would be subepithelial deposits. Well, uh, um, they look intramembranous. Do you see how the basement membrane surrounding them, entirely surrounding them? Uh-huh. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Intramembranous. And does that what does that capillary wall look normal or does it look thickened? Uh it looks thickened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thickened by those intramembranous deposits. Mm -hmm. And then in, in fact, Sabe, yeah, the one you're on right there at seven o'clock, it's uh, electron dense intramembranous deposit. Just to the right of it at six o'clock, the deposit's being resorbed. Right here. Um, so you have some, you know, it, it looks like a some old chronic type membranous nephropathy here with some resorption of deposits. Okay. Um, and then just trying to take a look at the podocytes. It looks like there's some effacement maybe around here. Yeah, it overall looks pretty diffuse in this picture. Uh, okay, so oh, oh, wait, wait, you, you, you went too far. Right, sorry. Go on, back one. Yep, right there. Okay. I'm trying to skip over one, sub. I know, I know. <laughs> okay, so this is another electron uh, microscopy. It's um, a little further, or I guess uh, higher power, excuse me. So again, we see these um, intramembranous deposits here. Um, some look like they're electron dense, like you mentioned. Yeah, and that's very thickened. Actually, in the bottom right, there's an unaffected capillary loop, and you could see what the normal thickness would, would look like. Oh. Yeah, right there. Yep. Yeah, so that's... As you can see how, how massively thickened they are by the intramembranous deposits. Yeah, like two, three size, times the size of that. Yeah. And okay. the podocytes? The podocytes... They look... Okay, here, but I would say there's effacement. It'd be partial effacement around here. It's kind of focal, right? Yeah. David, did you ever estimate it? I know in the report it just says partial. Uh, no, that's uh, I didn't go any further than that. Probably around fifty percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good job, Saba. Thanks. So uh, for diagnosis, I would say that this is both uh, membranous GN and then you also have the parahylar, uh, parahylar FSGS. Associated with large glomeruli. So I don't know if that qualifies for ORG or not, but uh, I think it does. Um, Steve's shaking his head yes. Um, and I would say it's PLA2 positive membranous. I would I would go. I would go that far. So PLA two positive with large glomeruli and segmental scars. Doctor Glassick uh, said in the chat said, "I'm surprised that nobody asked what his birth weight was. Nephroth under endowment should be considered." So I would say I'm surprised that Doctor Glassick didn't ask what his birth weight was, since he's the champion of this question. So, uh, do we know what the patient's birth weight was? We don't, but I know that he. I asked if he was premature. He said he wasn't. And Casey Gashti brought up an interesting question. Is it really birth weight or is it prematurity, realizing that they go hand in hand? Dr. Glassick, do, do we really know? Is it birth weight or is it prematurity? Is there, and is there a way to separate the two? Go ahead, Dr. Glassick. You're unmuted now. Oh, you're muted. 
Jesus, Prevera, you muting everybody? Oh, he's uh, muted, and maybe he stepped out. I mean, Casey does come that back. to me, but <laughs> he'll come back. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's it's an interesting question. I've really thought about until Casey brought it up, but uh, we, we may circle back to that. Um, so we have a diagnosis. Um, what's our next slide here? So a poll number three. Realizing what we just saw. Uh, yes, excellent read, uh, Saba. Great job. Um, what would approach would you take? Uh, would you just uh, weight loss measures, which uh, Dr. Reen jumped all over at the beginning of the conference, spoiling everything? Uh, also with RAS inhibition and SGLT2, which is already on, or two, rituximab, we have some membranous with option one, three, cyclophosphamide, we have some membranous with option one, four, a CNI with option one. So what would you vote for? One, two, three, or four? I love this question because uh, I think it'll spur a lot of discussion. We'll give it some time here. Again, this is all blinded we can't see what you choose so go ahead and yeah, we've talked about weight loss forever and we've talked about you know weight loss is like a fluid restriction it's like good it's you know good luck but you know bariatric surgery became so such a game changer in the last you know decade but obviously there's a new game changer in town which is a really a really worth uh discussion point especially with for something like this so um pretty good right there yeah, we can end the poll. We've got uh, 60% say, uh, number one, just weight loss measures and, you know, aggressive, we'd say aggressive weight loss measures um, with uh, conservative care. Uh, number two would be rituximab, treating the membranous with number one. Number three would be cyclophosphamide, also treating the membranous. And nobody bought into CNI. And this may be the first time in a poll in our biopsy conference that nobody's, we haven't had a single vote for CNI. I think we're, I think we're, <laughs> I think we're growing. Uh, showing my bias about cnis for the treatment of uh of most of these of most of these diseases so i thought that was, that's pretty interesting i'm gonna hand it Roger, uh, yeah you and uh, dick glasser have been the champions of explaining the dissociation between a negative serum pla2r antibody and a positive uh, PLA2R in the kidney biopsy. Uh, would you please uh, go over that again and see if it has any value here? Well, I, I I would defer to Dick if Dick's on, but if Dick's not on, I'll. Um, because he's written he's written a lot of this. I don't champion it. I just uh, I just say I just repeat what I've read. <laughs> um. Bill, you're going to discuss this case. So why don't you take that question? <laughs> Goes from Dick to Roger. Roger says, I can take it. And then he throws <laughs> it away. Thank you. Um, actually, yeah, I, I was, I think it's a fascinating part about this case and it definitely deserves discussion. But, you know, I, I think of it as there being a couple options. Uh, well, typically, the PLA2R antibody is going to go up even prior to proteinuria and then go down prior to proteinuria resolution. That's why it's such an excellent biomarker. Uh, and membranous. Uh, but in this case, you have it not positive in the serum, but it's clearly positive in the biopsy, and you have those membranous deposits that are PLA2R positive. And so the thought is of the, at least the last time I read about it, was the, the sink phenomenon is that it's possible that all the antibodies kind of being sucked up like a sponge into the kidney and it's not positive in the serum. Um, or it's possible that the patient's having a, on their way to a spontaneous remission and they were positive three years ago in the serum and now it's becoming negative, but you're still just seeing it in the biopsy. And I think that's the two different possibilities that I would think of in this case, but I'm happy to hear more explanations. Keep in mind that the, you know, what they're staining in the kidney is the antigen. They're not staining antibody. And that came out, you know, uh, I forget Dr. Glassick pointed that out a few years ago when this mm -hmm. came up. Yeah, it still doesn't change the timing and the timing is very odd. You know, one is, uh, you know, the sink or it's just gone. Bill, do you think that, you know, that it's just gone, um, given that he's had 10 years of, 10 years of proteinuria? It's well, really tricky you. here. Because, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. No, no. I was going to say, keep in mind, you know, that a lot of these deposits were resorbing. And he has another reason for proteinuria. I mean, you you know, our, the number one on everybody's differential is what he also had, which was ORG and um, a secondary hyperfiltration pattern of injury. But 
So I, I, I'm not sure we could use this proteinuria. It's kind of like if you have a di uh, membranous in a patient who also has diabetic nephropathy, you really can't quite use the proteinuria to determine what's what. And that's why PLA2R is so classic. And in this case, we don't really have that to use yet either, unless as we follow him, it becomes positive. But I think it's important in terms of what you're going to do therapeutically here. Uh, and I think you answer the question so eloquently. So it's either an immunological sink or the patient is get or the membrane is getting better. And with the fading away complexes, I will favor the latter. Yeah, and I think that might be what people were thinking by choosing number one as the most popular. You know, we have no sequela of the membranous right now. We have no progressive renal failure. We don't have a low albumin or edema. He's not having symptoms. We don't have a DBT. Uh, and we've got a subnephrotic proteinuria. So I think for me, that's why I chose one uh, for right now. But obviously, close follow-up is needed. Anybody feel strongly about treating him with rituximab? I mean, he's got, he's got a treatable lesion. I don't know that just because there's, you know, it does look chronic. Um, it, 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 and maybe it is going away. Um, Did anybody, uh, whoever picked two or three, uh, uh, defend yourselves? Dr. Reed, <laughs> what, did you, what did you decide? I, I actually chose the first one, but I would have taken glucose transport inhibitor out of the regimen. I would have gone with RAS inhibition and weight management program, because I'm not sure the role of glucose transport inhibitor in uh, secondary uh, type of uh, FSGS or even membranous. They are useful in IgA, but everybody is using every proteinuric disease, but well, I go with two. Yeah, and I think that's a minor, that's kind of a, a small plus or minus there, but, but as I pointed out, I know people that just, that they'll, anything they'll put them on now, but I'm glad that you know, you're at least a little bit discriminatory because that's the way I feel. It isn't, it's maybe it's not for everybody. And that, and you know, they're, it's not completely benign either, but, but that's not, yeah. So you wanted to go with one. Um, I think there could be an argument, you know, treat what you can treat. He's got memory and uh, it may be, you know, we don't know if it's been going on brewing for a while or, or maybe we just watch uh, and see what happens. And again, I'm glad nobody picked number four. Roger, um, I, yeah. I, I feel like if, even if we didn't find that secondary FSG at that perihylar lesion and the patient just had that membranous diagnosis, you know, with this presentation, that's pretty, that's a pretty low risk membranous. Uh, and I, I question even then if the, if FSGS wasn't even in the picture, if, if anybody would treat the membranous with two grams of proteinuria, normal albumin, normal serum creatinine for 10 years, even then I don't think I would give rituxin. Uh, and would you, I think that's a, absolutely well articulated point i wouldn't disagree for a second i agree would you what if the pla2 is positive in the blood how high uh let's say it's 300 then i would in spite of two grams of protein yes area. that's too high the the likelihood of spontaneous remission at that level is very low i would treat it even though the patient's not nephrotic yep okay i happen to love that answer too because <laughs> you have something to target but that's yeah. purely opinion but I, I really, uh, I really like that answer because I think that's a reasonable. I mean, there's nothing we don't really know what to do in this situation, but I think that's a very reasonable because of the level and the spontaneous remission and and the like. Even though the pathology and the proteinuria isn't that bad, I think that's a that's a good answer. Um, should we move on? Yep, let's move on. Um, so this is a follow up, Dr. Corbett. You want to go ahead? You're unmute. muted. Unmute yourself. Here, I thought I did unmute myself, and I just did the reverse. Um, over the course of, obviously, a couple of years, you can see in li almost literally two years, this is what his urine proteins did. I mean, he, he basically, uh, his albumin's always remained uh, in a normal range. The uh, urine protein creatinine ratios drifted down to, you know, less than a gram at one point, and then started to slowly go up again. And more recently, in March and again in June, they, uh, you know, we're starting to approach three grams um, per gram, which is what really uh, understandably made the nephrologist a little more concerned about what was going on. Uh, a repeat PLA2R was again negative. Serum creatinine remained normal. Uh, and albumin again remained normal. 
So then, then the real question was, and this was when the patient was referred, is what do we do now? As as it appears that the protein creatinine ratios are worsening, uh, what's to be done? And, and Steve, this so the the nephro they just did a max dose ACE. They added SGLT. Continued on inhibitor. continued on ACE SGLT two inhibitor. Uh, did the patient lose any weight at all in in, in term since in two years? Do we it know? It didn't look like it. To to my knowledge, and for what I could see, he, he and he even admitted he hadn't really lost any weight. And yes, this was all continued. You know, that was part of the thing, despite being on ACEs and the SGLT two uh, inhibitor, the proteinuria was worsening. So we're going to uh, we're going to we're going to repeat the poll here. Uh, <laughs> now that you know this, um, what would you do now? Would it change your original approach? Um, it's a little biased because we've taught a lot of people have, have talked about it. But is there anybody who would still give her tux and that? Let's see. So it's pretty much the same. I'm surprised that we that we. Um, and we still have some rituximabs after that. I, I give people credit that they're sticking by their guns, whether I agree with them or not. I give them credit because it seemed that uh, the, the the faculty discussion was really taking a conservative management. Um, I hand it back to Dr. Corbett. So after this case, I you know I tried to do a quick and uh, dirty literature search to see how often FSGS and memories kind of coexisted. And there may be something more recent, but boy, when you plug in these two terms, nine times out of 10, what you get is, is you know, renal biopsy series has been talking about what percent have memorous and what percent have FSGS in general. But I did find these two articles, uh, Alex McGill's, who uh, was a pathologist in Vancouver, and then this more recent article from India. And basically, they, these two papers essentially looked at this coexisting of uh, FSGS with uh, idiopathic, if you will, memorous because PLA2R wasn't being tested in, uh, at this time in many of these places. And what was interesting is, uh, yeah, go ahead. I don't have control yet. Is in both these papers, they are actually the same observations. Higher percent with hypertension if they had FSGS, higher percent with microscopic hematuria, higher percent, uh, higher levels of proteinuria, more often nephrotic, with, and they had a poor prognosis if they had the coexistence of an FSGS lesion. Interestingly, most of the lesions were peri high or were uh, uh, NOS lesions. There were only one person uh, was a perihilar lesion in the group that had FSGS and idiopathic membranous. They also noted larger glomeruli, and the and these findings were almost exactly the same in both studies. And they found that there was more extensive tubulo interstitial disease. So, you know, the the existence of FSGS with membranous in this in these two series portended a very poor prognosis. But the thing that stood out to me was that these patients were almost universally nephrotic, uh, which is very different than our patient, uh, who was really non-nephrotic at presentation and, you know, pretty much still remains, if you will, non-nephrotic, even though the proteinuria is approaching nephrotic range. Um, next, you know, as Dr. Glassick and Sethi have published uh, this whole issue of if you find an FSGS lesion and you don't have nephrosis, uh, which is what's happening in this patient, and you don't have widespread F foot process effacement, you think of a, a secondary FSGS. So, you know, that kind of goes along with what we're seeing. But in all fairness, you know, and I know Bill's taken it off the chin a couple of times in the recent past, you know, Bill's also, uh, and, and I forget who, if Raju or who else was on the paper, you know, looking at membranous and suggesting that the foot process effacement is indicative or at least reflective of how much proteinuria you're going to have independent of the, uh, you know, uh, independent of how how uh, widespread or how involved the, the glomeruli with, are with deposits. Um, I don't know, Bill, if you want to say anything about that, but I don't know if that has anything to do with, with this or not, but I, I think your observation is a good one, is you can have a lot of deposits and not a lot of proteinuria if you don't have widespread spread foot process effacement, which suggests that may be more important. Maybe not. Anyway. No, sorry. I was nodding and I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Sorry. I was agreeing. Next. So, you know, the probably one of the classic articles and the one that really kind of pointed this out was one from Vivette Degatti's uh, uh, lab in, in 2001, and this looked at 
you know, 71 patients with uh, obesity-related glomerulopathy and then compared it to 50 with idiopathic uh, FSGS, if you will. The BMIs on average were 42, but ranged from 31 to 63. Uh, they were slightly older, more often white. Uh, they were much less likely to have nephrotic syndrome, not unlike our patient. Glomerulomegaly, which was basically 226 uh, uh, in, in diameter, was 100%. Uh, the average size of the, not, the, of the idiopathics was something like, or normal, it was, uh, I think it's like 160, 170. What's interesting is that in their series, 19% had perihilar lesions alone, and then the re remainder had perihilar with quote-unquote peripheral lesions. So it seemed like perihilar was kind of a fairly universal finding in, the, in their series. And then again, foot process effacement was uh, basically very focal. It was like 40% effacement versus 75% or more effacement in idiopathic FSGS. And then in the next slide, you know, the course, which is the main, I think one of the main points. And one other thing to keep in mind is idiopathic FSGS patients, 80% of them got treated with immunosuppressive therapy, whereas those patients with obesity-related glomerulopathy, it was something like 8% got any immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, but their prognosis was much better. They, they, had, they had much more of an indolent course, I think, as someone already pointed out, I think Bill did, uh, with, you know, low levels of proteinuria that then slowly go up over time. Uh, and so, you know, at the end of the day, I think the discussion that's been made already is, you know, which lesion here is is most representative of what's going on and, and which lesion, I guess, is going to be uh, most detrimental to this person and how, how do we approach it, which I think we've gone through every, you know, several times trying to decide how people would approach this. I don't have a good answer. I, for sure... I agree with what everyone said, and this is what I put in my second opinion, that weight loss, uh, ongoing ARBs or ACEs, uh, and, you know, SGLT2 and or, in this case, Wagovi to help with the weight loss, I think would, would definitely be main, mainstay therapy for this patient. The part I wrestled with was, you know, whether I, I wouldn't have given cyclophosphamide or calcineurin inhibitors in this particular patient, but whether or not a trial of rituximab as kind of a Hail Mary wouldn't be, you know, it would be the, the, the risk it's hard to, you know, can't be, isn't going to be that great. The question really is how much benefit are you going to gain from it in somebody that's pili or 2R negative? And it's been that way for two years. Uh, I don't have a good answer, but I basically threw it out there saying, yes, you could do that and see if there's any benefit, but don't be surprised if there's not. And I'll leave it at that. So what, so... Uh, Premier, can you go back to his follow-up slide? His uh, case itself. Yeah, so yeah. now we're at uh, uh, 2.8 grams, serum albumin is 4.4. What number, Steve, would it take you to give or would give rituximab? Oh, I, I said now. You said now. I suggested now that it would be reasonable to try. I, I I threw that in there. I just said that I, I don't think I don't think the risk is that great. I'm not certain what the benefit's going to be, but I, I think that if you're going to do it, do it now, and then we'll see. But, you know, it, proteinuria and somebody, especially with that kind of damage to the glomerular basement membrane, you know, again, I know a lot of it reflects what, what the, uh, is based on the foot process effacement, but, you know, I, I think proteinuria, even in, in someone who has that kind of damage to the basement membrane, is still remodeling after who knows how many years you know, isn't going to be the best marker. It should improve, but it may never get back down to 300 milligrams per gram. So, yeah, and that's not, that wouldn't be our goal. And it's unfortunately, we can't follow a serum PLA2R either. But that's um, right. You have all I mean, you can follow in this guy is proteinuria at this point. That was kind of my original point. I would, I don't know. I don't think, I don't know if I would treat. I, I, I want to treat this guy because I love giving rituximab for PLA2R antibody. Uh, PLA2 positive membranous, but I don't know that I would here, and I'm a little biased now by everything going back and forth, so it's hard for me to give you an honest opinion, but I'm, you know, the proteinuria did go up, and I suspect that's why people stuck with their uh, their tuximab, and then when we repeated the poll, and, and I see your point, I mean, I like to say fix what you can fix, um, the problem is we don't know how broke it is to be fixed, and that's your point. Um, Bill, well, Bill, with this increasing proteinuria sway you, you you're rituximab, you, are you going to actually hold off on rituximab? 
I would hold off on rituximab. Yes. I think, um, you know, the serum abdomen is still good. Uh, uh, I know that the ratios are, are sort of consistently going up there. One, three, two, four, two, eight. And I see that his abdomen did go down four, eight to four, four, but even back, you know, in 2022, it was four, three. So I, I don't really know that his time average proteinuria is that much up. Um, I would still hopefully go with a little bit more weight loss, possibly gastric bypass, something like that, a little bit more aggressive and uh, do something that that might, that might affect his overall life a heck of a lot more than rituximab would do anyway. So Dr. Reen er, very early brought up uh, um, Ozempic. And then later in the chat, he says, I would do gastric bypass mm -hmm. or bariatric surgery. And Casey's just now saying gastric bypass, whatever, what happened to GLP-1, Dr. Reen? Why, why the flip? -flop? I will continue that because his proteinuria is getting worse. So I will think my experience with three patients is subnephrotic range proteinuria somewhere about 2.5 gram. Uh, actually, bariatric surgery has done quite well. Uh, everybody doesn't respond to the um, GLP inhibitors, but that will be still my uh, option in that in this patient. But I really I, think uh, instead of rituximab, go for bariatric. So, I mean, it's certainly a lot less invasive than bariatric surgery. It's, it's not, you know, it's it's gotten a lot better over the years than it used to be. It's not- Well, you uh, can band him, you know, you could do banding. No, I it. realize that, but it's nothing like giving a shot for six months and seeing what happens. Casey, That's why true. did you go, why did you pick uh, bypass as opposed to GLP-1? Um, it wasn't necessarily bypass over- um, It was weight loss. It was more like weight loss over immunosuppression. Got it. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's uh, Dr. Reen's kind of agreeing. It's maybe six of one and a half and does the other, which you pick. Um, I, I like that a lot. I uh, I don't know what that does. Steve, what's the data? And if I missed it, I apologize. The data on weight loss for uh, ORG proteinuria? I mean, it's beneficial when it happens. There are several papers out there that have shown that with weight loss, proteinuria improves. Uh, there's not a ton, but there are definitely papers out there. And I, in previous talks, when I've given about FSGS in general with and I, I could have put it up here. I guess I didn't. Um, but yes, it's been beneficial. I mean, the problem is, is as, as Dr. Reen brings up, is, you know, weight loss by dietary and exercise is not all that successful. But when it occurs, it definitely is associated with improvement in proteinuria, just as, you know, weight loss with bypasses. And Steve, what, what, and I don't know if I, again, I'm sorry if I missed this, but what percent of people with OR, ORG, uh, end up with end-stage renal disease. Is that relatively uncommon or they? Well, it, it showed in that it, it, it happens. I, uh, it's yeah, much I, more, just general, you know, like over the, I think over the course of that follow-up is like maybe, uh, 15, 20% of those patients. So, so there was like, uh, I mean, so that'd be over the course of however many years, I forget what the, I can, I can tell you now it's over the course of 96 months. It was, uh, renal survival was about 70%. So it's, it's, it's not out of the question, but it's no, also it's not, not benign. It's not benign either. No, it's right. Um, and I'm sorry, I missed that slide. Uh, um, but we also have 10 years of follow-up on this guy, uh, which is, you know, uh, two thirds of the slide and he hasn't really gone anywhere. So that kind of might influence you too, that his ORG may not be as progressive as, as some of the others. I mean, um, would anybody do another biopsy? I would not, but it, Prevere and I talked about putting that in the, our sixth poll, we were running out of polls. So we actually thought about it, uh, but no, I don't think I would. I think it's just, you bite the bullet and decide which, yeah, I mean, you know. I, I guess the question is exactly as you're alluding to, would it, it really change anything? Cause I, I discussed that issue with the referring physician who is uh, doing what we all agree to do, you know, weight loss, et cetera, uh, and or, you know, a Hail Mary with rituximab, you were trying it or not, because I'm sure he still has membranous lesions. And it's a matter of whether or not if he's, you know, despite being PLA2R negative, there'd be some benefit to giving it. Um, yeah. I mean, I could see an argument for, for rituximab. I could see an argument for bariatric and bariatric as much for his health as, as for his kidney, because his kidney seems to be doing pretty well in spite of the prognosis isn't hundred percent good. But he's had 10 years, he's done pretty well, although he's still young. Um, so, you know, who knows? Uh, I think they're all reasonable, reasonable options. Um, anybody else have any strong opinions? Mario, what would you do? I think you wanted to give rituximab. No. 
No. I would not biopsy him again. I would not give rituximab. I think that uh, he still uh, can use, for example, uh, the addition of a diuretic to enhance the antiproteinuric effect of the ACE inhibitor. And I will reach out for these newer drugs for weight loss. And as you pointed out, if after six months, is going nowhere, then I will uh, bite the bullet and pursue gastric bypass surgery. I don't think we have uh, evidence that this is an immunologically active membrane. Interesting. And I, I, I'm not convinced it's not immunologically uh, mediated, but I'm not sure it's immunologically important. But uh, I'm going to end there because I agree with Dr. Rubin, and uh, I always get the last word here. So, Mario, it's Team Rodby. Uh, Ruben today. We're going to go with that approach. Uh, but as I said before, I think that's, it's a really great case. Thanks, Steve. It was a really good presentation and and there's a lot to talk about. Um, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, anybody not on our email list, uh, throw us a direct message. We'll put you on the email list. Please join our YouTube uh, channel. This will be posted shortly by Dr. Baxi. And I think we're off next week, uh, but we'll be on in two weeks uh, again uh, with another great case. And until then, everybody stay safe.